you would take your Bibles and open up to 1 Samuel chapter 16 again. We're going to continue this morning with our study about David, a man after God's own heart. And, uh, you know, this is a journey, and I'm not sure exactly where all this is going to take us, because I'm discovering new things as I'm, as I'm studying this uh, David and, and what it was about him that made him a man after God's own heart. Um, we remember we talked about Saul and how God had put Saul in, in as king over Israel, and then Saul kind of wandered away and he disobeyed God on several occasions, and God said in, <clears throat> that he's going to raise up a man after his own heart. And in Acts it says, it's kind of our key verse for this series, it says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God des- testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, wouldn't you like to have, that, have God say that about you? That there is a man after my own heart, or there is a woman after my own heart. What does that mean? Let's think about that phrase a little bit. What does that mean? You know, I think it means that David had a heart that was similar to God's. He had similar passions, similar desires. Now, bear in mind, when the Bible talks about the heart, most of the time it's not talking about that organ within your chest that pumps blood all throughout your body. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the core of your being, your your emotions, your passions, your spirit within you um, is what he's talking about. It's the part of you that that makes decisions, whether they're good or bad. So what was it about David that made him special to God, that God could say, I think it's the only person that God ever said that is a man after my own heart. Well, it certainly wasn't because he was perfect, was it? I mean, he committed adultery, he um, got the woman pregnant, he lied about it, he tried to cover it up, and even committed murder to try to cover it up. That would be like our president having an affair and getting a lady pregnant, and then to try to cover her up, put her husband on an airplane, send him across the Middle East, and then, you know, accidentally having the plane shot down. That would be similar, okay? That's what David did. So it wasn't that he was perfect. He had had many failings. He had many shortcomings. So we're going to dig deep into David's life, and we're going to try to discover what it was that made David a man after God's own heart. Now, last week we talked about that David had a deep sense of who God is. As he was out there herding sheep, and he wrote Psalm 23 and many other great psalms that we have today, we can see that he had a deep understanding of who God is, even as a shepherd boy. Now, David was from a a highly respected Jewish family. He was a son of Jesse. When people said, you know, there's a son of Jesse, it seemed like everybody knew who Jesse was. And he had this great Jewish family. And so probably on the Sabbath day, they would gather around and maybe hear a priest talk about uh, their history, talk about Moses, talk about Noah, and all the stories from from their past. And so uh, David probably had a good understanding of some of those things. Well, let's pick up the story today in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Now, this is, Saul is still king. David is still a shepherd boy. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now, let's stop there. Do any of you have a problem with that verse? I, I had a problem with that verse for years. It says, An evil spirit from the Lord tormented him for somehow i'm like huh god would send an evil spirit how god sends good things right god sends good spirits how how do you come to grips with that verse where it says an evil spirit from the lord came upon saul how how can that be how how does that happen Well, I think we have to get an understanding of the spiritual realm and how the spiritual realm works a little bit to understand this. You know, God created Satan. We don't like to think about that, but Satan is a created being and God created him. Satan and his demons um, fell from heaven. God allowed that to happen. They fell from heaven. They became the source of evil in this world so that mankind could have a choice between right and wrong, between good and evil. 
You know, if man had no choice, God would get no glory. There's no glory in a bunch of robots serving you, right? There's no glory in you uh, creating or inventing a bunch of robots that automatically do what you tell them to do. I mean, there's no glory in that. But God created human beings to have a choice. And he wanted us to have the choice to serve him or not to serve him. We see a little bit of how that works when we see the story of Job and we see the inner workings of God's court and how that God allowed Satan to attack Job. It says in Job 1.6, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. So Satan came with him and God said, You know, have you seen my buddy Job down here? And Satan says, well, you know, but you've given him everything. If you take some of that stuff away, he won't serve you. God says, all right, I'm allowing you to go test him. And Satan went out and tested Job. God allowed him to do that. I think we can see a little bit into the realm of the spiritual realm as we look at that story. And I think that's what was going on here. I think this evil spirit from the Lord, God allowed him to come and to pester Saul, we could say. In the New Testament, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and he was, he was getting after them because there was sin within the church. And so he wrote this letter to them, and he pointed out some things that were going on in the church. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. So this is what was going on in the church. And then he says what to do with that person. In verse 5 he says, Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the faith so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. What was he saying? He was saying, take this man out of the church. Okay, He shouldn't be associated with you. Hand him over to Satan so Satan can torment him, make him so miserable that he'll turn back to God. That's how God uses Satan. That's what was going on here with Saul. God was allowing Satan to make him miserable so that he would turn back to God. Now, let's read the rest of the story, starting in verse 15. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. When the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. Wow. So, when Saul would be troubled by this evil spirit, David would come and he'd play his lyre or harp, some would call it. Which this picture, that, that, um, that is a replica of a lyre that was found in Megiddo in Israel not too long ago. And this guy took it and he, and he actually built one. And you can go on, um, on YouTube and you can watch him play this thing. And it, it's amazing. But it was quite possibly one just like the, t- the one that David would have had back in, back in those days. So he would play this and the evil spirit would leave. Here's the next thing that I think we need to know about David. Is that David understood spiritual warfare David understood what was going on in the spiritual realm he understood that there's a 
there's a spiritual world around us that we can't see with our human eyes. But it's just as real as this pulpit. It's just as real as the person sitting beside you. And it's around us all the time. See, I think when David played his harp, I don't think it was just any old tune. I, I think there were specific tunes and maybe, maybe he sang some of the songs that he had written. Maybe he was singing some praises to God. Maybe like, let's turn to Psalm 47. Just an example. There are many that we could turn to. But this is just one that possibly he was singing as he was playing this harp. It says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued the nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord, amid the sounding of trumpets, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on His holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. So maybe it was something like that, that David was singing and praising God. And all of a sudden, that evil spirit left him. You know, there's many, many, many um, chapters in the book of Psalms. It covers a large array of of um, topics from prophecy to laments of travail and despair there are prayers asking God for help but I think the most prominent one that there's more than anything else is praise to God praise to God so I think David understood the spiritual battle that was going on I think we need to understand that too which brings me to my second point this morning to win a battle, you must identify the enemy's objective. To identify the enemy's objective. John 10.10, Jesus said, The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal. To steal your joy. To steal your place as a child of God. To steal your kids. To steal everything from you. That's his, that's his goal. To kill. His ultimate goal is to take your life, to take your spirit, to take your soul. That's his goal. He is the angel of death, the Bible says. To destroy. Look at the mess our world is in. We're a long way from the perfect Garden of Eden, aren't we? Anything that is good, Satan is out to destroy it. Your family, your marriage, Anything that's good in your life, Satan is out to destroy it, the enemy. So how does he do that? Well, the second thing is to win a battle, you must understand the enemy's weapons. You must understand his weapons. The first one I want to talk about is scheming. He's a schemer. 2 Corinthians 2.11, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are very familiar with his evil schemes. You know, as an army would scheme and strategize, do the unexpected, that's how Satan is. Sometimes he brings us things that are totally, totally unexpected. He tries to take us off guard. He try, he's scheming against us. Sometimes he even uses church people, doesn't he? If he can get a church person to say something offensive, to say something that will drive someone else away from church, he certainly will do that. And give that person an excuse not to go to church. He's scheming all the time. And then there's counterfeiting. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says, Even Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. And he makes himself look good, doesn't he? For every good thing that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. Think, for example, when Moses was doing the... Um, 
the miracles in front of uh, Pharaoh. God had told him, you know, you take your staff and you, you drop it down and it'll turn into a snake. Moses did that. And guess what? The magicians were able to do exactly the same thing. There were several of them that the magicians were able to do. Satan has some power. Satan can do some, some amazing things. You know, the Bible says when the Antichrist comes, many will be deceived because of the signs and wonders he does. Matthew 24, 24 says, For the false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Satan has some power. He has some deception. He has some counterfeiting going on. And there's counterfeiting that goes on within churches all the time where people do things that they think look good. They think are the right things, but they're counterfeit. And I won't go into detail on those this morning. Then there's stealing. Mark 4.15 says, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. He's a, he's a thief and a robber. He steals your joy. He steals your faith. He steals your finances. He, he's a thief and a robber. And then there's fear. Fear. A good way to understand what fear is is false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. Fear is the opposite of faith. Many people are fearful and they don't know what they're fearful of. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Why does a lion roar? A lion roars to strike fear into the heart of their enemy. Are you fearful this morning? Satan wants you to be paralyzed by fear. Fear of failure, fear of death, fear of the future. He knows if he can scare you enough, you'll be paralyzed. You won't be able to move forward. Fear. But the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But here's the main weapon that Satan uses. The one he uses more than anything else is lies, is lies. Jesus said to the Pharisees one day, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You think about the first time we ever hear about Satan. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When, when the serpent came to Eve, what did, he, what did he bring? He brought lies. He said, did God really say? You know, I think God really said this. You will not surely die. Your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to see good from evil. You're not going to die. He's a liar. He brings lies into your life. Satan doesn't know how to speak the truth. It's not possible. You know, it's interesting. When you're an unbeliever, Satan comes to you and says, well, you're pretty good. I think God will God'll have mercy on you. You'll get to heaven. I mean, you're a good person. And you don't need Jesus. that whole Jesus thing and that whole church thing. You don't need that. You're going to be all right. And, and he, he brings those lies to you. As soon as you become a believer, he tells you, you're not good enough. God can never save you. Anybody relate to that? Anybody relate to that? He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. So we've talked about the enemy's objective. We've talked about the enemy's weapons. Let's talk about to win a battle, you must understand the enemy's strategy. His strategy. His first strategy is to attack from the outside. Now I'm talking to believers here. Unbelievers are already in Satan's kingdom. He doesn't need to attack them. They're already believing the lie that they, if they just live a good life, they'll be okay. They'll be all right. So Satan's going to attack believers. 
In fact, the more involved you are in ministry, the more he's going to attack you. Even Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was crucified, was being attacked by the enemy. I think if he's going to attack Jesus, he's going to attack you and I as well, right? You know, when our military declared war on Iraq, they first sent in wave after wave of cruise missiles. And then they sent in the bombers to start taking out the, the, um, all the facilities that they had over there. They took out their anti-aircraft guns first. and they, they took out, they called it softening the enemy. That's what Satan does. He, he shoots from a distance to start with. Maybe it's just a lustful thought. Maybe it's a negative thought. Maybe it's a pornographic image on your computer screen. or um, Maybe it's an unfounded thought of mistrust of your spouse. Maybe it's a prideful thought. It's called temptation. You know, it's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. But I like this quote, you know, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can sure keep him from building a nest in your hair. Is that why some of y'all shave your heads? That... <laughs> no, but it's true. You can't stop the temptations coming sometimes. They will come. That's Satan shooting from a distance. But you can stop from dwelling on them. You can stop from letting that bird build a nest in your hair. But Satan keeps throwing them, don't he? He keeps throwing them all the time. It's kind of like fishing, and he keeps putting them out there all the time to see if you will bite. Satan's strategy is keep hitting you again and again and again, trying to, trying to soften the target, trying to find your weak spot. He doesn't care what it is. Maybe he can get you to open up a little door of bitterness, a little door of unforgiveness. Um, maybe it's, it's immorality, maybe it's hatred, maybe it's, maybe it's slander, maybe it's gossip, maybe it's drunkenness, whatever it is, he's going to keep hitting you and hitting you until he finds your weak spot. And when he does, he tries to desensitize us to evil by just keeping putting it in front of us all the time until, we, oh, that's not a big deal, you know, it's, it's no big deal. It's called softening the target. And when he finally gets in, when he finally gets you to give, it in, give in in one area, maybe it's some secret sin that no one else knows about. Now he brings us to the next area. He conquers a small area in your life. He conquers a small area in your life. You know, when our troops went into Iraq, they softened the targets. When they would softened them enough, now they could send in the ground troops. And they sent in the ground troops, and they had this small area inside enemy territory that was secure enough to set up camp. That's what the enemy does. He finds an area inside your heart where he can set up camp, where he can, where he can kind of camp out, and he can get you to start believing a lie. Start believing a lie in that one area. And as you believe that lie more and more, he starts adding to it, and he starts strengthening and fortifying that area. Maybe it's pride. Oh, that's one of his favorite ones. If he can get you to, to dwell on pride, to have pride in your life. He's brought down many a Christian with pride. The lie that it's all about me. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's someone that did something to you and you just can't let it go. And he gets you to hang on to that. Maybe it's a secret addiction that nobody else knows about, but you've got it and you know you've got it. But it's not a big deal. It's just a small area of your life. and You hang on to that. Maybe it's some type of sexual sin that you're just hanging on to. After he conquers that small area of your life, now, now he's got a place to set up a base of operation. Remember, his objective is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now he's going to fortify that base and he's going to make it indestructible. The enemy continually reinforces his base. The longer he's there, the more indestructible it will be. It's called a stronghold. An area that is not submitted to the authority 
of the rest of the territory. It's a stronghold. In your life, a stronghold is an area that's not submitted to God. It's not submitted to God's word, and you're still hanging on to it. And, you're, and it's starting to control your life. You know, you may be a follower of Jesus. You may come to church and shout hallelujah, especially on Palm Sunday, right? And yet, there's that area of your life that you struggle with. Bad thoughts, anger, depression, sin. Maybe it's your marriage. Because somewhere deep down inside, Satan has tricked you into believing a lie. And until you replace that lie with the truth of God's word, you will never get victory over that. Ephesians says, do not give the devil a foothold. And he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to people out in the world. He's talking to Christians. Do not give the devil a foothold. You know, the enemy is very patient. He can sit there for years on his little military base, on his little stronghold. He'll sit there for years, sometimes 20 years, sometimes 30 years. I've seen people sit on something for 40 years and 50 years, and all of a sudden something happens in their life, and they snap, and you see it come out. He just piles up more sandbags and digs his foxhole deeper over time. The longer you let him sit there, the harder it will be to break that stronghold, to demolish that stronghold. The more you believe the lies of the enemy, the more you believe that the lies are true, the harder it is to see the truth. Because then he goes to the next one. He attacks from within. He attacks from the within. He expands his territory. He'll use his base of operation to attack you in other areas. If it's unforgiveness, it'll lead to bitterness. It'll lead to resentment, which will lead to anger, depression, despair, and finally suicidal thoughts. Remember, the Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Maybe it's immorality. It'll lead to guilt, blame, lack of respect, and again, eventually, to suicidal thoughts. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to make your life miserable. And ultimately, he wants to destroy your soul. You know, I'm here to tell you this battle is real in the spiritual realm. This past week, <clears throat> I, uh, you ever have one of those weeks when things just didn't go right? You know, I had one, it wasn't like any big catastrophe happened, but just a lot of little things. And, and it, just, it just, well, Goldie will tell you by, by Friday, or Kendra will tell you too, by Friday, I was grumpy. Anybody hear me? Anybody else ever have a week like that? Am I the only one? All right. I, I, was, I, was, I was really grumpy. So Goldie and I are going out to eat the other night. And uh, as we're driving along, she says, uh, what are you preaching about Sunday? I said, spiritual warfare. She says, oh, there it is. Every time I preach on this subject, Satan attacks me. He attacks our family. He attacks our life. Um, everything that's going on. You know what she said? She said, you need to listen to some music. <laughs> you need to listen to some good music. Just like Saul needed to listen to some good music. And I'm here to tell you, it works. It works. I don't know why that never occurred to me before that. But, you know... I guess I'm kind of dense sometimes. The battle is real. The battle is real. Which brings us to the next one, which David understood. Praise to God silences the voices of the enemy. Look at this verse that David wrote in Psalms chapter 8. It says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children of infants and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Praise works. That's our first line of defense against the enemy. 
Now think about Saul. He was tormented by an evil spirit. He couldn't rest. He couldn't sleep. He may have been to the point of going mad, but when David played his music, it silenced the voices in his head. You've got to silence the voices in your head. Sometimes Satan brings those things in your mind that you're like, where did that come from? Where did those thoughts come from? Where did that? You've got to replace them with something else. You've got to replace them with something, something good in your life. It's powerful. In fact, it's so powerful. You remember the story of Paul and Silas? Paul and Silas were in prison. And it says they were in prison, and at midnight, what were they doing? Were they moaning and complaining about their, their situation in prison? No, it says they were praying and praising God. They were singing and praising God. And what happened? An earthquake came, shook that prison, and they miraculously got out of prison. Now, you... Maybe you're here this morning, you're like, Pastor, did you forget today's baptism? You're supposed to be talking about baptism today. What's that have to do with baptism? It has everything to do with baptism. Because I'm here to tell you, when you get baptized, it's the beginning of your journey. It's not the end. It's the beginning of your journey. It's not the end. Baptism is making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Making a commitment that from this day forward, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. It's being obedient to what Jesus said when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't stop there. He says, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And it's one of the things, spiritual warfare is one of the things. Because here's what can happen, especially to you, Lizzie and Kim, this morning. You'll get baptized today, and that's awesome. We're excited about that. But beware, Satan probably won't leave you alone. He might come to you tomorrow and say, yeah, you know, that didn't really mean anything. You think you're really saved. You really think you're that good. Well, let me tell you, you're not that good, but Jesus is. Jesus is. We're, we're saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. But here's the good news. You now have the Spirit of God within you to help fight. Just like David did back then. Because the Bible says that when David was anointed to be king, it says the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God came upon him. He had the Spirit within him that he could fight that battle against that evil spirit that was bothering Saul. This verse came to my mind this morning in Ephesians. It's a couple of verses. Ephesians 1, 19, 20. Where Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor on God's right hand in the heavenly realm. You notice what it says. It says the same power. We're going to talk about Christ's resurrection next Sunday on Easter. The same power that rose him out of that tomb, you have within you. You have within you now, just like David did back then. The same power. Reminded me of the song that Jeremy Camp wrote. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. I, I watched his testimony. It's amazing. You ought to get on YouTube and watch it. He's talking about how him and his band were in Kyrgyzstan doing a, a concert. And they were told that, uh, you know, at this concert, you can't, you can't really uh, talk about Jesus. You can't, um, it's against the law to try to convert somebody to Christianity in Kyrgyzstan. And so they're, they're praying and they're not sure what's going to happen. And, and, um, but they, they go and they, they didn't think anybody would show up because it was out all over the news that people shouldn't go to this concert. But they, they went anyway and, and 8,000 people showed up. And he said, it, it was amazing, they started singing, and he said, then I said the name Jesus, and 2,000 of them left. But they kept singing, and they kept, they kept um, just, you know, just worshiping and just singing. They, they told him, you can't talk, you can't say anything, but you can sing your songs. And so they just kept singing. And he said, and all of a sudden, 
All of a sudden, the Spirit of God just moved and everybody came forward and hundreds and thousands of people were saved. And he went home and he wrote this song, The Same Power That Rose Jesus from the Grave Lives in You. Lives in You. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for that great power. Father, we praise your name for that power this morning. I pray, God, this morning um, for Kim and Lizzie as they make this commitment to uh, show the world that they've decided to follow you. They've decided that um, from this day forward, they're going to live for you. I pray, God, I pray that you would empower them with your spirit that... Um, when Satan comes with his temptations, they'll, they'll be able to recognize what it is and they'll be able to say no. And your power is going to help them do that. We thank and praise you for that. God, if there's anybody here this morning that, that hasn't made a commitment to you yet, I, I just pray that they do that today before they leave this place. Accept what you did for us on that cross that we're going to talk about next Sunday, what you did for us on that cross, that we can have that power, that we can go free. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.